on to our last speaker of the afternoon. Thank you all for sticking around for this. Nico Frankel is one of our first year residents. He's gonna to talk to us about senior locum syndrome and uh, I guess enlighten us about uh, where we are in terms of gene therapy. Thank you. Thanks everybody um, for uh, sticking for the last presentation. So let me tell you um, our latest data on gene therapy on senior locum syndrome, but let me tell you first our uh, uh, initial work uh, before we get there. There's really three points that I'd like you to get in here. Understand what senior locum syndrome is, the human genetics, the mutations involved in it, and uh, the animal model that we made. And then lastly, how we do gene therapy preclinical trials before we go to humans. Um, so, no financial disclosures. So, you know, I really just wanted to start with a case presentation highlighting senior locum syndrome. We have patients here, but this is from a published JAMA article. Uh, in this article, th there was a 20-year-old uh, male that presented with increasing night blindness um, and difficulty with his peripheral vision. On examination, he had some mid-peripheral pigmentation, uh, vessel attenuation, as well as waxy pallor of the optic discs. And this led to the diagnosis of retinitis pigmentosa. What was weird about this case and interesting in, uh, in this publication was uh, there was a flame-shaped hemorrhages as well, which is not typical for retinitis pigmentosa, as well as a for a 20-year-old. So they suspected uh, um, they suspected high blood pressure, and indeed, uh, this patient had a uh, blood pressure of a, uh, 230 uh, over 130, and he was uh, diagnosed with advanced kidney failure with a creatinine of 8.2. Uh, he had subsequent uh, um, uh, workup uh, with an ultrasound and showed smaller kidneys with increased echogenicity, and the biopsy was advanced uh, kidney disease. So nephronophthesis is a triad of small kidneys, uh, cortical medullaris, which explains the increased echogenicity, as well as interstitial fibrosis, which is nonspecific, but you can see it in any advanced kidney disease. And uh, retinitis pigmentosa, ret early retinal degeneration with nephronophthesis uh, defines uh, what uh, senior locum syndrome is. Uh, just to finish up with this case, three years later, he had a kidney transplant, which is usually the case for uh, uh, all senior locum syndrome patients. Um, if not, they usually uh, do not survive. Uh, a little bit about what senior locum syndrome, uh, but this was first described in 1961 by uh, two uh, separate groups. Uh, and I've mentioned already, it's both uh, an early type retinal degeneration as well as nephronophthesis. Uh, the visual symptoms, as most of you know, can present early in life, first uh, to second decade of life. And uh, usually they present with polyuria and polydipsia, but it's very, very interesting to see flame-shaped hemorrhages. That's why I really presented that case. Uh, this is a very rare disease. Uh, prevalence is one in a million. We actually have here in Utah, we've identified two patients with uh, uh, senior locum syndrome, which uh, you know, I, uh, I won't talk about too much today. And we also know that this is autosomal recessive. Um, so there's seven genes associated with senior locum syndrome written here, and PHP ones to 10, and PHP stands for nef uh, nephronophthesis, and the protein it encodes are called nephrocysteines. There's actually a lot more nephrocysteine genes that I reviewed when I was still a PhD student, but all of this just caused a kidney disease. These seven are the only ones that cause retinal degeneration and really why I wanted to concentrate on this. And for some reason, I really was interested in NPHP5 um, and because it just has uh, all the mutations cause 100% uh, retinal degeneration phenotype. Other, other reasons why I was interested in NPHP5 is not only does it cause senior locum syndrome, but it can also cause non-syndromic LCA, meaning without the kidney disease. I mapped out all the mutations known uh, in the disease. So this is the gene, these are just the mutations, and all the mutations cause deletions, nonsense, or frame shift mutations. Basically, we think it makes a non-functional protein. There's no NPHP5 in cells, and uh, that's why it's causing disease. So to study NPHP5, we know it's non-functional in humans. We made a knockout mouse. We basically added a gene trap early in the, uh, uh, in the gene, causing basically a non-functional protein. Uh, I'd like to uh, draw your attention on this graph. This is a histology from a post uh, you know, day 15 of uh, mice. These are the blue things here are the outer nuclear um, uh, layer, and then the red things is where uh, outer segments should be. And uh, the red thing is NPHP5. In knockout mice, we don't have NPHP5. Functionally as well, we recapitulate the, uh, the absence of uh, both scotopic and photopic function. The red line here are the knockout mice. You can see it's flatlined um, very early at postnatal day 14. To give you a sense, I, mice open their eyes at P12, so two days after opening, they're already blind. 
Um, so we also know that in the knockout mice, it causes early onset retinal degeneration. So in here, in this uh, um, column in here are the knockout mice. And I just want to draw your attention on the thickness of the outer nuclear layer compared to uh, normal animals. And as you can see, at one month of age, it's almost complete. This is just showing you statistically, um, but of progression of the um, progression of uh, the retinal degeneration. So, you know, why does it cause uh, uh, retinal degeneration? We think that NPHP5 is important in this little area right here in the connecting cilium, which connects the inner segment to the outer segment of photoreceptors. Um, and in here, what I can show you is, uh, so the green things in here is what the uh, staining for basically this little structure, the connecting cilium. And in normal mice, it, it, you, we see that it elongates, but in the, in the knockout mice, we see that it's just little two dots. It never really elongates. Uh, it's really hard to see in those uh, unmagnified views, but I did electron microscopy. And in here, very early, postnatal day 10, in uh, wild-type animals, we see you know, the nice connecting cilium in here and the outer segments. And then in the NPHP5 knockout mice, the connecting cilium just does not look, uh, it looks abnormal. Outer segments never form. So, uh, so that's the animal model that we've established uh, for NPHP5. I just want to let you know that after this, uh, there's two other spontaneous uh, models that was identified. A cat that was blind was shown NPHP5, and as well as a dog, a pit bull terrier uh, that has a spontaneous mutation. This dog is very important because uh, we're uh, both our mouse and this dog is uh, the preclinical um, uh, models to use for uh, the gene therapy we're using. And there was just a talk by uh, Gustavo Aguirre on gene therapy in Arvo recently, one of our collaborators as well. So why do we think NPHP5 or seizure locan syndrome or this disease would be a good model for gene <coughs> therapy? We think that there, it's good because there's a window uh, that cells survive um, that we can add back the gene so that we can regain function. That was the hypothesis. So again, um, early on the disease, we see retinal degeneration in the knockout mice. You know, there's, still, still, there's still some, uh, uh, some cells remaining, and we think most of these cells are cone cells. Um, so, so uh, because in this model, the, uh, everything degenerates pretty fast, we did a genetic trick to make basically all the outer nuclear cells become cone cells. Um, and with this, we show that at, even at two months, the uh, cone cells remain. They never degenerate. But even if they don't degenerate, they still have a flat line in, in their ERG. So it's non-functional, but the, but the cells are there. So we can, uh, the question is, can we wake them up uh, for gene therapy? Um, and so the latest results I'd like to show you. So we have an AAV8 virus that has a flag tag. You know, the tag is just, you know, I'll show you, show you pictures, but it's colored, uh, we call it red, with a human version of the NPHP5. So basically we're in trying to introduce back the human form of the NPHP5 in these mice. And what we did is a very technical experiment of uh, doing subretinal injections in these mice at uh, postnatal day 15 and harvesting them um, two months later. And I just want to remind you, at two months, you know, there's basically just two or so cells left. And these are our most latest data. So in the untreated eye, uh, the flag tag or NPHP5, it's not there. But in the treated eye, we can see, you know, more red in here. Uh, in the uh, connecting cilium or outer segment area. There's also some expression in the RPE, but the AAV8 virus usually targets both photoreceptors and some bleed through as well through the RPE cells. So that was encouraging that we can express it again. And most importantly, um, we can see rescue of function. So from a flat line in here of the knockout mice, after we give back NPHP5, we can see some rescue effect, which is very, very promising. This is just quantification uh, of showing you that in knockout, there's some uh, substantial uh, increase. So this is a, a very, very uh, promising for gene therapy. Um, so also, we've started as well looking at you know, the proteins that mislocalize. So this is one of the cone opsins uh, in mice. But in the untreated, they are usually mislocalized in here. And we think that they are, you know, the outer segments are forming more and they're mislocalized less. Um, but we're still doing, you know, uh, finishing up the study, looking at other proteins, as well as doing electron microscopy to see if there's uh, any more rescue of the outer segments. Um, but, you know, with that, really, I just wanted to say, so uh, with our group, as well as uh, Dr. Aguirre's group at UPenn with the dog model, these two models will be invaluable before we go to human trials. They do have two candidates already, too, 
uh, people with NPHP5 mutations that have surviving cone cells that we're thinking. So these data are going to be valuable before we go to the human, uh, uh, human experiment. So in summary, uh, NPHP5 mutations cause a senior locus syndrome and non-syndromic LCA or RP. Uh, we know that in the NPHP5 knockout mouse, there's early retinal degeneration, and that cone cells survive longer, allowing for gene-based replacement therapy. And we have shown functional rescue of retinal function in NPHP5 knockout mice after some retinal injections. Uh, it'll be interesting to see whether they really form uh, new outer segments. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, you know, my mentors, Wolfgang Baer, uh, Dr. Bernstein, uh, Kristen Hanke, who did the subretinal injections, very technical experiments, as well as other uh, members of the Bear Lab. Um, I'd like to just uh, finish off with just a quality improvement project before I get to questions. But uh, the QI project that I'm working on is a multidisciplinary approach for patients with ocular uh, cicatricial pemphigoid. I really credit the past uh, resident, Zachary Juice, for a uh, um, for uh, starting this and uh, getting me on board, as well as Dr. Patel. Um, so the, the problem is management of patients with uh, OCP requires a multidisciplinary team approach, including oculoplastics, cornea, and dermatology. Um, there is currently no system to coordinate fast access of these <coughs> patients to these multiple specialties, which can really delay, a, uh, delay in the diagnosis as well as treatment for OCP. And uh, the delay of treatment could be very just devastating that could result in permanent blindness. The goals for this project, the, in the first year, what we wanted to do is to create a website for easy access uh, to, to the multidisciplinary team, both uh, in-house as well as uh, for referring physicians, and as well as to identify faculty members from the uh, different uh, subspecialties uh, to help coordinate the care of these patients. Uh, we So just for these two goals, we have already have a, uh, a website um, uh, that uh, we're just finishing up, uh, and it should be live hopefully in the next several weeks. Uh, there's a lot of process, and I've learned a lot through this process as well. It's data driven. Uh, for example, um, just to let you know how you know how detailed our uh, the website uh, people are. So uh, I've learned that uh, most people, or 80% of people that go to the Moran website don't go from the Moran, but they Google it actually. And so um, if you type in uh, OCP in Moran or Utah, this would be one of the first hits that we'll get. So that's very, very interesting. Um, people really don't use these columns up here to find you know, services. So I, I, I've learned a lot in this. We've also identified several faculty members that will be heading up uh, uh, or that will be leading the charge in, uh, in, uh, in dermatology. It's going to be, of course, the chair, Dr. Zone, as well as uh, Dr. Clark has stepped up. You know, in our, in our group, it's going to be Dr. Lin in cornea and, of course, Dr. Patel as well as Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Crum in our oculoplastics uh, uh, clinic. Uh, the future goals really in year two and year three is going to be very, very interesting, and I hope I can, there's some dermatology residents interested at this already, and hopefully we can garner more interest for the um, uh, interns. But we'd like to develop uh, pre-existing standardized assessments at each patient visit to consider like epic templates uh, to study uh, uh, outcomes in the future, generate standard diagnostic algorithms including biopsy approach, specific exams, et cetera. And, you know, to have really this group to be talking to each other to discuss treatment algorithms. <laughs> and uh, finally, really in the future, to identify faculty from other departments, GI, ENT, uh, for patients that have non-ocular extracutaneous disease. Also, I'd like to use, use this model uh, for other faculty or for other residents interested in a multidisciplinary approach for other diseases to have a kind of a template of how to, uh, to do this. Uh, for this project, I'd like to thank Dr. Patel, uh, Dr. Joes, um, Linda Bolt, Elizabeth Neff in our uh, communications department, as well as Alana Schrader. With that, I will take questions. Thank you. So, so Nico, congratulations. I mean, you've taken on orphan disease, and, and Wolfgang's uh, described it to the detail we've never seen before, and now moving eventually to treatment. This looks very, very promising. Mm -hmm. uh, the big problem we see with these orphan diseases is that look, at your rate you're talking about, there's what, 300, mm -hmm. 350 people in the United States. So there's no pharma pharmacological company that will, will step mm -hmm. up to do that. And uh, uh, hopefully, though, this is a, an avenue and it is a gene vector and a procedure that the process will be able to utilize for, for other areas. Uh, otherwise, these kinds of things, even though we, we can do them, 
the, the cost of going mm -hmm. to the FDA will be a barrier in which it's unlikely to happen. You know, absolutely. No, I and I always hear that comment. Definitely, it's going to be it's going to be difficult. But hopefully, you know, senior locum syndrome is just one part of the uh, big other class of diseases of ciliopathies that could uh, that could benefit in a personalized medicine if we have specific mutations and if we have a window of opportunity, then we can tailor it for patients. But you know, it's it's not as straightforward as 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 you said. But yeah, I think the FDA needs to take a different approach. You've got a group of them, mm -hmm. if you have one, then it doesn't need the whole expense and cost of going through the whole process again for a, a, a variant in that class. Mm -hmm. As of now, they kind of make you do the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.